Hello, my name is uh, Fru Nkimbe. Uh, today is May 30th, 2021. Uh, this is a very special edition of African Hour. And my guest uh, on the show today uh, really need no introduction. Here in Boston is uh, my regular technician behind sound person who has been always sitting behind the scene and making sure that everything works well. Uh, Mr. Francis Awunkam, how are you doing? I'm doing well, Pafro. Happy Sunday to you. Happy Sunday. And from the lone state of Texas, Comrade John Akoro. Uh, comrade, how are you doing from the lone star? state <laughs> of Texas. I'm doing great and thanking God for it. I mean, it's a beautiful Sunday and uh, I'm very delighted to be sharing part of this Sunday uh, with you. And Francis, I accept uh, very warm greetings from me out here. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, like I said, it is an honor. I've watched many of your shows and you are a veteran in the struggle. And uh, I think that it is but befitting to have you on the show to share your thoughts and share your views. And as a media person, uh, you know that uh, we give platform to people to share their ideas and uh, we discuss ideas and not people. Uh, I know you are very strong on that uh, opinion and I believe and trust that uh, my audience will really get the best out of you uh, this one hour. So um, again, once more, uh, welcome on the show. Our, our main focus is really about our struggle. And before we really delve into uh, the discussion of our struggle, I would like uh, to ask each of you just to summarize to our uh, viewers and listeners uh, and walk us a little bit back uh, to where we came from and where we are and where we are heading to in the struggle. Uh, Mr. Akoro, could you go ahead, please? Okay, thank you for, for giving me the, uh, <laughs> the pride of place. Um, I like to say sometimes uh, when you're given the, the opportunity to delve into, you know, how we find ourselves where we are today, the temptation is so great to go so in depth and it can take a really, really long time to, you know, get that out. But to summarize this whole thing is uh, the people of the Southern Cameroons uh, found themselves um, at crossroads in 1961 when the British decided not to, you know, uh, complete the mandate handed to them by the United Nations to prepare the Southern Cameroons for independence. They felt that they needed to take a shortcut and the accusation or their or their or their you know their feeling was that the southern cameroons uh did not have enough resources you know to self-sustain as a state and so they got into an unholy arrangement with france and you know and tried to see if they could either force us to join la republic du cameroon that was uh, already independent in 1960 or the already independent federal republic of nigeria in some new experiment that hasn't happened anywhere else uh, called independence by joining. And those, that is what sowed the seeds of what we have as this court today. At that time, a lot of international figures, including Ambassador Zablowski of the United States of America, cried foul. Even uh, the Secretary General of the United Nations at the time, Jack Hamas George, also indicated that what was, was actually happening at that time was sowing seeds of future discord. And here we are today, over 20,000 people already killed, although the media and the rights organizations continue to talk about 3,000. They've been talking about 3,000 for almost two years today. It gives me the impression that from the moment they counted 3,000, the killing stopped. What I want to say simply is the people of the Southern Cameroons, and take note, Southern Cameroons, not us, in the Southern part of La Republic du Cameroon, Southern Cameroons as, as, as an entity, as a standalone entity, the people of the Southern Cameroons have one clear aspiration today, ending what we consider to be a kind of Slavic experience that we've had 
with La Republique du Cameroon when we came in voluntarily in a referendum in, on February 11, 1961, to join them in a federal system of two states equal in status, supposedly equal in status, to see if we could, uh, you know, forge fortune together. But unfortunately, they turned it into slavery by the use of so many tactics and all whatnot. They even went as far as finally abolishing the, the federal uh, system, instituted, I mean, a kind of, uh, of experiment called the United Republic of Cameroon. They themselves ended up abolishing that by decree in 1984 and simply swallowing the Southern Cameroon. So they, the people have come of age and they say this Slavic experiment has got to stop. That is why we are where we are today. Thank you, comrade. No one else could have summarized it better than you. You are more or less like a, a, a historical encyclopedia about our struggle. And uh, thank you. We'll delve into more detail and you will uh, share your wisdom with my audience. Francis, as uh, the uh, younger generation with young minds, you've been uh, in the struggle since 2016. And um, uh, may I use this opportunity to put you on the spot to share what uh, the young eyes and the young minds uh, are seeing today, oh, please. Thank you, Pafu, and thanks um, uh, our senior, um, Mr. John Bakuro. I've watched so much of his videos. As you mentioned before, I'm always on the other side of the screen and today I happen to sit. And before I, I share my little contribution, I want to apologize for occasionally you might hear a um, little bit of background in my, behind me, um, doing double duty. The younger generation, right? <laughs> you are, we know you are a father at the same time, that's good. So um, I, it's, it's wonderful that Comrade uh, Makuru has us um, covered all, all about history. And in truth, um, he, he said it perfectly. What's up on you? Prior to 2016, um, I knew nothing of um, the Southern Cameroon struggle, nothing of, of the history, um, because maybe uh, you had the, um, I don't want to say luxury, but you had the experience of having lived um, um, the Southern Cameroon's uh, struggle and the history, but I, it was never taught for us in school, and for someone like me being born and raised in Douala, um, the whole notion of, of, of Southern Cameroon was strange, except for a pamphlet I, I found once going through my father's um, um, documents having to do with um, um, the, the conference in Boya, the first conference in Boya. Besides that, I really had no idea of um, of our struggle. And since 2017, I found myself immersed um, like any young young person that wants to learn about their history and that wants to, to um, understand what is going on. I saw myself going back to start reading and watching videos of people like Dr. Luma and um, um, I've forgotten Chief. Chief, um, I just forgot his name right now. Thank you very much. And, and, and reading about um, such great minds and, and, and learning. And since then, I, I think that um, like any person that learns and knowing what we've been robbed of, um, I feel more energized um, than anyone. And I'm, I'm ready to join my own, join the fight and contribute my own little contribution um, to, to make sure that um, the Southern Cameroon is free. And I think this is one of um, La Republic's biggest uh, mistake. To have let this to go so so long has allowed people like myself who knew nothing about the struggle to be informed and to learn from our seniors. And now we join them and it's no longer just the, the seniors and elders fighting, but it is now the entire Southern Cameroon. Thank you for the opportunity. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Francis, uh, with that uh, young mind. And uh, I know that there are many of your generation that have also joined the fight. And you know that uh, this is a relay. 
uh, our ancestors, uh, our first premier and second premier and all those they are of blessed memory now, uh, the baton is uh, in our hands and we are holding it and soon we'll hand it over to you and by the, uh, our prayers is that we'll hand it over to you when we are, we've crossed the uh, Mongo on the west side and uh, heading, marching triumphantly and when we reach uh, Boya, we hand it over to you to continue. Thank you very much. Um, Comrade uh, Akuro, I really want you to clarify this because most of my non-Ambazonian uh, friends and even some Africans, um, they have told me that um, we are doing uh, a disservice to ourselves as Ambazonians and helping La Republique perpetuate this lie that uh, we are part of uh, Southern Cameroon. And in so doing, they have manipulated and uh, uh, deceived the whole and convinced the whole world to believe that uh, this is an internal uh, problem and that uh, any country has a minority, that we are a minority within uh, their on, uh, within the uh, Cameroon, when they say Southern Cameroon. Could you please, for someone who knows nothing about uh, uh, the Cameroons, uh, I will have uh, a map up to actually uh, show this. Could you uh, differentiate what the Southern Cameroon is? Because I believe in any country in the world, there is a southern uh, part, uh, uh, audience and listener will be shocked to also know that there is a southern part of French Cameroon, which is not the southern part of British Southern Cameroon. So please, I'm handing it over to you, the son of the British Southern Cameroon, today, the Republic of Ambazonia, to set the records straight and clear now, let me begin by saying this. Uh, generally, um, if you see my writings and if you read articles on uh, Timescape magazine and every other uh, out, uh, out outlet where I contribute, I basically refer to it as the once independent state of Southern Cameroons. This makes all the difference because if you just say Southern Cameroons, they have the feeling that, uh, you know, like you said, it is a Southern part of Cameroon. But it is actually referred to, and in most circles now on the international scene, we are actually succeeding in getting people to understand that it is a once independent state of Southern Cameroons. And I always like to clarify this, that the Southern Cameroons is the first ever thriving democracy in Africa, south of the Sahara. Because by 1954, we were already practicing democracy when La Republic was still under French protectorate. You can remember that very well. In 1954, our forebears decided we were not going to be swallowed by Nigeria. And that is why they left the parliament in Enugu and returned to Boya and set up a government of the Southern Cameroons. And again, there is also this very important clarification that, may, that should be made. When we talk of Southern Cameroon, it is not in relation to La Republic du Cameroon. It's because the British, when the British were handed part of the Cameroons after the, the end of the First World War in 1918, when the League of Nations was formed and all of those things, the British divided the territory they had into two halves. You have British Northern Cameroons, which today is in Nigeria, and they have British Southern Cameroons. So you understand where this notion of Southern Cameroons com comes from. It is not the south of La Republic du Cameroon, it is the southern part of British Cameroons. So Britain had British Northern Cameroons and British Southern Cameroons. So, uh, Mr. And so uh, in let 1960... Me just, let me just cl clarify that, Mr. Koro. You made a very important point. So Britain, because of administrative reasons, they had to divide the, uh, Br the Cameroons that was uh, under their protectorate. So, uh, so as to have the Northern British Cameroon and the Southern British Cameroon, just exactly. so, for administrative reasons to make it easier for them to govern, right? Sure, sure. And these two entities 
were administered from Nigeria, from different parts of Nigeria. That's why the British Southern Cameroons was administered from Enugu, and the British Northern Cameroons from the area which is now called the, uh, the Adamawa state of Nigeria. So when you get this clarification, I think it makes, it, it, it makes things very clear. So it really isn't in relation to La République du Cameroon that were called the Southern Cameroons. And uh, like I pointed out earlier, La République du Cameroon tried to play on this, uh, you know, on this naming stuff and try to, you know, push us to the, you know, fringes and then try to confuse the international community. And that is why I say the British Southern Cameroons became an issue because we were politically mature, because we were politically very alert. That is why the uh, phobias left Enugu in Nigeria because we did not want to be swallowed anywhere. We wanted to maintain our identity. We wanted to maintain who we are. That's why our phobias left the parliament in Enugu and returned to Boya and formed a government. And Let me which government... again, uh, uh, comrade, uh, comrade. When once you have given this very important uh, points, I would like to keep in so as to make our uh, uh, audience understood. Because of our British uh, system of debate and actually resolving things by the ballot and not by the bullet, when our forebears left Inigo and come to settle, there was no gun shot. No. So that is okay. I just wanted to make that absolutely so that we... no gun shot, no problem at all. Of course, because we're a separate entity from Nigeria. Just like we're a separate entity from La Republic du Cameroon. The Nigerians didn't fight us. No. And the British government that was in charge of these various territories simply took note of the fact that the people of the Southern Cameroons refused to be absorbed in Nigeria, refused to be administered again from Nigeria, and wanted to be on their own. And so that is why they had to, you know, follow our people to the territory in Boya where they found a government where they formed a government and this government was formed following all democratic principles that you know and then there was already in place a system of mandates that is why in 1954 when they formed that government the prime minister was Endeli. five years after there were elections and Endeli, who was a prime minister and the incumbent lost the election to foncha and Endeli and Foncha stood on the public rostrum together. Endeli congratulated Foncha and handed over power. Come where right. a party in power loses and gracefully transfers power to an opposition party. This Come is right. what our people want to go back to. Yeah, comrade, that's a very, very powerful point. Name me even uh, almost 70 years after, uh, after the independence of African nation. Name me any one single state that has peacefully, the incumbent lost the election and, and peacefully handed over peacefully to the incumbent opponent. Just name me one state. And that happened in 1959 because the first premier started, uh, uh, took off power in 1954. Before. After five years, there was a highly contested election, even though as narrow as it was, he peacefully surrendered power. That shows our maturity, isn't it? Exactly, but that's exact, that is obviously what I'm saying. You remember uh, the former uh, U U U.S. Under Secretary of State in charge of, of African Affairs, Mr. Tibo Nagy said, and I repeat, and he said it over and over, that the real aspirations of the people, he referred to us as the English-speaking people of the of the 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 Cameroons, but I said of the people of the once independent state of Southern Cameroons, is to take control of their own affairs, so that we are able to determine our development priorities, mm -hmm. so that we are able to set in place that functional democratic system of governance where the people have a say in the management 
of their own affairs. Where the people determine their priorities, where the people choose their leaders freely, and where decisions are made on basis of consultations, not through the barrel of the gun. This is what we are seeking to return to. This is why we are telling the world, you took us and forced us to be unevenly yoked with the people who don't believe in openness, with the people who don't believe in transparency, with the people whose favorite spot is embezzlement and mismanagement, with the people whose favorite spot is, is I mean, is autocracy, whose favorite spot is actually, uh, what should I say, high-handedness in governance. This is why we are saying that the doom that they were brought onto us, they should rise up to the occasion and see us back out of this mess. I'll tell you this, listen, I was born in 1974, two years after the Federation was abolished. But when I say to talk to you today about the history of the Southern Cameroons, you easily have the feeling that I was even there in 1954, and I'll tell you why. Because just two years, two years after that famous joining, uh, independence by joining, a lot of our parents already saw that we were in a failed experience. They were already cracked. They were way back from 1962. And so I lived in a home where my parents were politically alert. They, I mean, they were so dissatisfied and just going through everything that was happening. And they took upon themselves to educate us, their children, about where we came from, how we found ourselves where we were, and why we were facing all the troubles that we are facing. And I just like to congratulate uh, Comrade Awonkam because when Foncha started reminding Aijo that my people will not accept this. My people are being poorly treated. President Aijo asked him, which people are you talking about? Because they had already brought in the divide and rule approach. They had already come in and geographically divided the Southern Cameroons into Northwest and Southwest and done one very important tactical thing. Made sure they underdeveloped the roads that linked the two uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, entities and ensure that there was no road linking Kumba to Manfe, which was passable, because if they allowed that road to be passable, there would be a lot of communication among the people of the Southern Cameroons, and that could be a problem for them. They made sure those things didn't work. They made sure that we were so seriously enclaved to the point where we couldn't even communicate among ourselves, because in that fashion, they could divide, they could break us, and they will make it impossible for us. So when Foncha was overwhelmed, Late Foncha, I remember my father saying this, that late Foncha told them, I have told President Ahijo, that when our children grow up, they will fight. And of course, he was right. That's why we are fighting today. That is why we are standing up today to say the generation of the Fonchas did what they could at the time. They passed the baton on to us. I will not pass it to Comrade Awonkam and the others without completing the job, like okay. you just pointed out. We have to complete it and make sure we hand over to them and the other generations of Southern Cameroonians coming a free country where they can stand and be proud and be treated as human beings, not treated as second class citizens, where they will stand and be looked upon and treated on basis of what they can offer, not on basis of whose child they are or which village or ethnic group they come from. Okay, thank you very much, comrade. I quite uh, remember, uh, if my memory uh, trusts me, this is, I grew up also hearing this, that um, the late uh, uh, General Semenge, you know, the uh, Hijo and his policy, they have always wanted to assimilate us and call us two cubes of sugar that uh, we would melt and that uh, he had wanted, you know, our own system is a system that we debate idea. We are very tactical and strategic. And by so doing, we are very thoughtful. As small as people may think that we are, but our brains are mighty. And uh, that is what uh, we go by. And I heard that uh, Hijo had wanted to just crush us, but, um, General Semenge warned him that uh, 
the Englishman is what uh, mostly the Ambazonian is what they may call small nobby sick. That when you see people who even in their tradition, they always dance and uh, with a fist, if they don't have a spear, they have a stick, the people don't engage them in a battle. And of late, uh, he passed away and we have been very, very patient. I have heard uh, horror stories about uh, our people. Any Southern Cameroonian has a horror story to tell. I think we need to uh, get on, uh, uh, organize a special show for that to show <laughs> how we've been patient and we have endured all this. But we have come this far, not because we were the ones who fired the first gun, but because they made that mistake and step on a sleeping lion. They land uh, beer on November 30th, 2017, which war on us. And according to him, it would take three weeks, three months, and we will be done. And it is taking uh, five years now. Let me see so, the, the, the opportunity at finish. this point. Yeah, OK. Yeah. Let me finish the point, comrade. So I was just saying that just like you said that your father uh, was telling you all the stories, I would equally say that there is always time for uh, everything. And I think Pa Foncha and our leaders had a vision. I was uh, a party police in that uh, Congress of uh, in 1985. And I quite remember we met at, uh, the, com uh, at the community hall in Bamenda, one evening, we, I mean, we had all this energy. We were, we, we were frustrated as how these people were speaking French to us. We never understood. They were, I mean, they were a colonial occupier. We asked uh, 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 Paul Foncha, uh, what is all this? He said, keep your mouth shut and go to school. I mean, those guys had wisdom. Uh, and I think that if you can see now, the chickens are coming home to roost. When I see that we are scattered all over like stars, it is that wisdom of someone 35 years ago who, who really saw and said that we shouldn't start something premature because it, it was a privilege to saying that it is easier to kill the serpent in the egg. And if we had made that mistake then, they would have crushed the serpent in the egg. You cannot control the serpent when it, it hashes. So this is the right moment that we are standing up and claiming our right. Over to you, uh, comrade. Yeah, thank you very much. I was like saying that um, I wanted to draw one little uh, parallel here. You know, uh, when you pointed out that uh, <laughs> in 2017, when Mr. Bia said, when he declared war, he thought it was going to be a walkover, a two week stop. I'd like to take you back a bit to January 2017. You know, sometimes some people have asked me, um, or I could see, they say, but how did you get into the struggle? What is it that chased you away from Cameroon? And I burst into laughter. I said, it's difficult for anyone to easily understand that uh, I had a 19 year old career at CRTV. And uh, I mean, I was well paid, I was working there. So why should this man have found himself living? Once you are a Southern Cameroonian, a bona fide Southern Cameroonian, you have it in the blood. You don't get satisfied with less than you deserve. Because I've told my people this all the time. Anytime you settle for less than you deserve, you end up with less than you even settled for. And that is what is haunting even those who went recently and accepted something called special status. They didn't even know what it was. And now they can't have even a tenth of that thing. They can't have even decentralization that was on offer and they rejected to get to, you know, special status. So what happened is in 2017 and in January, when the consortium with all the segments of society had held the Cameroon government on the balls. And we said, we want concrete things. They came with the usual demagogy. Send ministers from their own everywhere. They were hemming people trying to, just sign this thing and call off the, the, the strikes. 
call up the the school boycotts, call up the boycotts of of the courts, and everything will be fine. We will do this, and we were like, you really need to go all the way. But this is what happened on January six, two thousand and seventeen. That was the day I officially attended the meetings of the consortium because I was working in the background. So I hosted them. I hosted that meeting in my Sweden Monja hotel. Even the hotel management never knew we had meeting. And it is at this meeting, this very important meeting, that we now had the views of Southern Cameroonians from all the nooks and crannies of our territory. And the people were determined and expressed that we should put pressure on the government of Cameroon by all peaceful means possible. It is on that 6th of January at Monja Hotel that we agreed to institute what is now known today as the ghost towns. So when the government of Cameroon saw the first ghost town on January 9th, respected to the letter, without a stick, without a stone, without a gun, with no cohesion, everybody shut down. It was 100 plus percent. The government of Cameroon knew that trouble had come. And so they try to intensify now with what they know as a favorite spot, bribery and corruption of the leaders to, you know, let go. But when it wasn't going, they realized that they were in for a very nasty moment. Because at that time, we even asked them, can we simply go back to the federal experience as it was in 1961, so that we continue living together, but respecting each other. You stay in your side, I stay in my side, but we are together and all or not, so that each person is, is, is treated with some dignity. But you see, they wanted to do, let me just round up fast. They wanted to play the game they know how to play best. And so when they noticed it wasn't going, because we called the second ghost towns for the 16th and 17th of January to put pressure on them. And when on the 16th, they saw the ghost town seriously respected. On the 17th, they saw the places shut down. They did one thing. And that was the most significant thing they did. And they were too certain that it was going to end it. Remember, they shut down the, the internet. They declared the consortium and the SCNC, uh, you know, uh, personal non grata. That is, they banned these two movements. And then they, start, they started a manhunt after the leadership of the consortium and the SCNC. But one thing happened to them. Because this is where they were sure to succeed. They were sure to keep the diaspora out of it by cutting in, uh, internet and therefore barring the territory from having any access to social media. But God, because it is the time that had come. While they were landing on all members of the consortium in Bamenda and Boya, they forgot that I was in Yaoundé. And so on that night of the 17th, I want to let you know why we're here today. I had this pinch of wisdom from the friends who sat with me when we followed the decree, banning everything. And they told me, Mr. Kuro, you will be surprised who they were, Mr. Nkimbeng. These were members of the armed forces of La Republic du Cameroon, who were Southern Cameroonians, who were with me at my residence, who were having fun. Colonels, uh, uh, commissioners of police, and they're like, Mr. Kuro, so after this has happened now, what was your plan B? I said, no, the consortium, we're not your plan B. They said, don't be stupid. Don't tell us you start something so sweet like this. And we are beginning to look up to it and you tell us that it is ending. Why am I telling you this story? So you get the depth. You get the extent to which this freedom is needed, even by those who appear or who are seen to be standing against it. So that is when they told me, look, you have to do something. So I picked my phone. I called Patasan. He was running and he needed to hide somewhere. I said, look, as you're going to hide, I am going to transfer power abroad because this is what is going to happen. This people are expecting to get up tomorrow morning and say the consortium is dead, everything is finished, and they will use a high hand and it will end. So when I talked to a few people, that's how I got Mark Barra. I've never met Mark Barra in my life, but I've seen him on Facebook and seen him doing things. But I knew Tapang Ibo. So that is why the issue now in collaboration with these members of the Cameroon Armed Forces, we agreed on how the letter should look like. I had to write as if it was Bala, the president of the consortium. Okay. That had four, that clairvoyance, that was, had foresight that he was going to be arrested. And he decided to write in advance and appoint people abroad 
in advance of his arrest, knowing that I'm going to be picked up and something has to continue. This is where the Cameroon government lost it all. Because okay. that letter came out in the night, got into the media. By the morning of the 18th, they shouted, the consortium is dead, long live the consortium. And the bridge was built with the diaspora. That is why until today, you find that the diaspora gives instructions, ground zero obeys. That is what has kept this movement. And that's what foiled the plan of La Republic du Cameroon. They lost it on that day, on that day. Because okay. if they didn't get into that high hand, if they continued negotiating in good spirit, we wouldn't have been where we are today. But the moment yeah, power comrade. crossed... Yeah, thank you very much on that. Uh, I, I, Francis, uh, I, will, I would like you to chip in. You know, with all what you have explained and narrated, it didn't come out of thin air. It came because of our educational system. Definitely. Our background and our civic that they taught us growing up to know how the government functions. And I quite remember that Anglophones are not violent. We believed in the force of argument and not the argument of force. And those, before you get into a debate with someone, you use your knowledge, you think of ideas and you think of the consequences of your action and what, what can come and things that can pull people together. Yeah? We, th we know that uh, we can disagree, but respectfully disagree and not being disagreeable. While on the other side, the people that we are dealing with, uh, their own mantra is that they dictate to you. They don't want to listen to you L'état c'est moi. That is how I can put it. But with that, with, with this kind of a system of people who like to uh, debate, listen to the other viewpoint, because we believe that for every opinion, there are two sides of the coin. And for you to make a good decision, you should be able to listen to both sides and then come out with a, 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 a unified uh, uh, opinion. Unfortunately, we are dealing with people who, from their colonial masters, they believe that what I say goes. So with that, I mean, I commend all of you who were there to do this. It was that spirit that we inherited from our fathers who did not even go to school. And these were people who, whose roots are, are deep in our culture. And that is one thing as us Ambazonians, we respect our culture knowing that wherever, if you don't know where you are coming from, you would not really know where you are going. And in fact, thank you for that uh, explanation. And I chilled my heart to all of you who did this and saw it and where uh, uh, here is where we are. I would only say it takes one person to turn on the switch and then there will be light. And I would say you, people who courageously turn on the switch while you were in the lion's den, uh, whatever happens now, we have the button we are leading forward. Francis, you've been leading so, listening so patiently. Please, uh, is there what, um, I would like to hear what uh, uh, you think of what uh, the veteran uh, comrade has been telling us. Thank you very much again for the opportunity to talk. I will just contribute just on um, two um, two points that um, you both have made. And I, I believe the word Comrade Akuru used was bridge. I think bridge is actually the right metaphor for this linking um, Ground Zero and the diaspora. And I also believe linking our forebears and also linking the new generation, the bridge that, that, um, that he, he made mention about. And the, the other point he, he talked about also was, um, was um, the history. There's no Southern Cameroonian, I think, that can learn of the wealth of our, of our culture, the, um, the wealth, the weight of our history, to understand that we're the first people to be democratic and to learn all these things, and then not, not challenge um, the status quo. So on those two points, we, we, 
the points that Comrade Akuru made and one that um, I, I resonate a lot with because um, at the beginning of, of, um, of the current um, evolution of the crisis, I would say, because it's been going on forever, um, I was of the opinion that the only thing that we should go for was uh, maybe to come up with, um, go back to, to a federal or confederation you know, in, in the beginning. That's where I was thinking, I was, I was thinking we could go. But looking at, as the, as the um, things evolved, looking at the, at the level of brutality um, on the other side, seeing soldiers going into hostels of university students and taking them out was when for me the things in my mind begin to change. Because I always understood that if people protest, you come and disperse them, they go back to their homes, then it ends there. But when students have run into their dormitories and soldiers go in there and pluck them out from their from from the dormitories and bring them outside to torture them. For me, that's when I began to say, okay, we cannot um, we cannot live with these people. And not because so much that I have a hate um, for the other side, it's just from the understanding that I have now that there is no way Southern Cameroonians can live as a free people in a union. It's just not possible. And everything that I've seen so far has not dissuaded me from, from that decision. So again, the bridge from our forebearers to this generation is that they have passed on that history to us. And it has allowed us to finally realize that uh, we just have to join them. And the one last thing I would say is that I had um, the good fortune once to have met um, Pa um, Joe Litumbe. And the only thing I could say to him was, Pa, thank you. Thank you for keeping the embers going for a time when this generation can come and maybe add some gasoline to it. Because it takes a, a lot for people who have experienced that history to be seen the way they were, they were trampled on. And I just asked myself, it's amazing this, the discipline that these people had not to be terrorists like they want to call us. Because if you know your history and you see the way people are trampling on you, what stops somebody from them, them strapping a bomb to themselves and say to hell with this? But as Pafu mentioned earlier, um, our forebearers knew that the time will come. It is time for the younger generations to keep learning about the history, to keep getting um, different experiences around the globe in all the sectors that you can think of. And now is the time where we have expertise in all domains, in every field and endeavor out there in the world, in the diaspora, and even on Ground Zero, we have Southern Cameroonians that are expert in it. From the ICJ or ICC to the United Nations, every institution, World Bank, you would go there and see Amazonians that have picked up um, experience. So I think now that now is the time. I just wanted to talk on those just those two metaphors that um, Comrade Kuro talked about and which powerful talk also about our culture. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Francis. Uh, you raise a name of a giant. Uh, he is, uh, I would say, like the Mount. Uh, 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 Fako, the Cameroon mountain, Ambazonian mountain for us, Pa Litumbe. Pa fought a fight and fought and he is still fighting in us. Uh, there is Pa, I never uh, met Pa, but uh, when I called from here in Boston, Pa was on his sick bed in Douala. When I talked to him, uh, could you believe that Pa actually came on my show while in, in the hospital and sent me a lot of audios and a lot of written information. He said, my son, uh, this is for you and you make sure you publish this. Pa was a fighter and he fought, he carried that button right to the end and handed it over to us. And uh, I, I, I just wanted to, uh, bring that up in uh, in memory of uh, of Pa. Pa is gone, but uh, not gone in our hearts. Comrade Kuro, I wanted to bring this to you to for you to actually briefly uh, delve in this. Um, 
when you list, when you read the Eritrean struggle, which went for almost uh, 30 years, they are even smaller than we are against Ethiopia. And you know, against Ethiopia, Italy and Britain too was uh, involved. And in the end, it ended through uh, a referendum because they stood up and uh, Ethiopia was actually getting economically bankrupt. And La Republic is in the same situation. Recently, um, and many other nations, they've gotten their independence through a referendum. Britain, getting out of Brexit, they did not uh, elect few people to go and decide, it, to go and decide their fate. Uh, it had to happen through a, a referendum. That is democracy. I'm asking if we, uh, we hail from that uh, democratic institution, Recently, I've been overhearing that there is uh, a meeting uh, with the Swiss and all these international uh, uh, organization to meet with us and then few people will go and meet with them. I wanted to ask briefly your own take on that. Uh, whether uh, is it possible for a group of people to go and meet with this European nation and know who they are and how they have treated us to decide our fate, I give credence to our forebears because if they were, we are here today talking because of what? Because they met and refused to sign because had they signed any piece of document with La Republic, we would have been finished. Regardless of what all these, so, all these intellectuals with a lot of title behind their name are looking condescendingly on these people that they did not do their job, they did their job the best they could. And I don't personally, I don't think any few, any group of people could go and decide our fate. It should be done on the ground in the democratic way, like the Brit it happened uh, uh, in, in Europe for Britain to exit, and it happened for the Eritrean independence, uh, East Timor, Southern Sudan, and you name it. Over well, to you, uh, sir. Yeah, thank you. Uh, before I get to that, let me very quickly go back to something that uh, Mr. Wonkan pointed out very briefly. Yeah. Yes, he said something about the fact that uh, at one point it felt that uh, perhaps we could get even into a confederation or some kind of thing with the Republic of Cameroon. I just want to very quickly point out that, listen, the people of the Southern Cameroons have given the Republic of Cameroon several opportunities to redeem themselves, to show they can be gentlemen where we could forge something together. But I like to point out that La Republic du Cameroon are people who never respect any agreement. So it will even be erroneous to even just have that thought pass. Fortunately, you said it was in the past. To even have that thought pass, I can have anything to do with La Republic du Cameroon. At every standpoint, they have, always, they have always said, this is what we would do, and they do the exact opposite. Go right from the tripartite conference, where they make high sounding things of greater democracy, constitutional this and that, and then came up with something called decentralization. It never happened. Recently, even when they were deceiving themselves and all that, they created a DDR. It, they, I mean, that their DDR is a picture. They created a commission on, bi on bilingualism. Has that commission ever helped to change even some of the few things that you used to see there and all of those things? No, it hasn't done, and done any inch. And finally, they, they, they held a grand national dialogue. They themselves tried to, to say they were going to give a special, a special status to an, an entity that, uh, that we are. But even they can't meet up with what they are talking about. There are people, you don't trust them. You don't ever have to get into any deal there because they don't respect any regulations. They are not different from France. To go now back to the, now to the question that you asked. Listen, before there was a referendum in Southern Sudan, there were meetings. There will definitely be meetings with people with rebel leaders, with leaders of various liberation movements and all whatnot, where they will have to agree on the mode of consultations with the people. It happened with East Timor. They had to meet with people and at the end of it, they agreed on a referendum and that's where they agreed on the modalities of having that referendum run. 
It was the same thing with, uh, with Eritrea. So there's def there are definitely going to be meetings. I understand where you are coming from. Because right now, those, the Southern Cameroons actually has no government. It has no representative government where people have been elected here and there and all or not. The leadership are those who emerged from the various movements that decided to champion our liberation movement. So these people actually can't, like I should say, really speak completely and legitimately on behalf of the people. What they can do is simply transmit the aspirations of the people. They'll be able to hold sway at a certain point in time, but this is going to culminate definitely to the people on the territory being the ones who say the final word. And trust me, you can see for yourself what is happening on the territory. The people on the ground in Southern Cameroons are very, very politically alert. They're yeah. politically alert. The people know what they are seeking. They know what they want. They know they want independence and nothing short of it. The people on the ground in Southern Cameroons know them more, there will come a time where they have to talk to them. That is why even when they take instructions from the diaspora or from the people who emerged now as uh, you know leaders, they pick and choose. You must have noticed that. Those that don't stand according to the aspirations of the people, they ignore them. Those that meet the aspirations of the people, they respect them. That is to tell you, the people of the Southern Cameroons are bidding their time. There is no process that will result to total peace, which will be made up of a small group of people sitting somewhere and taking decisions on behalf of the people of the Southern Cameroons. They will lay the groundwork. But the final word, the final say, will come to the people of the Southern Cameroons. You have noticed that even the late Christian Cardinal Tumi felt he needed to talk to the people to know what they felt. 69% of them said absolute independence. A year later, the CDN also organized, I mean, a kind of survey. Talk to the people. Why do they keep going back to the people and not to the leadership or people who are out there? Because they know it is the people who have the final say and you'll be in a system where you have to listen to the majority of these people. This time, 89% of them said they don't want to ever have anything to do with La Republic du Cameroon. I know this, I know these figures come up and they okay. frighten La uh, Republic du Cameroon to think that they should do everything to subvert us by force and everything, but the international communities uh, uh, community knows where this will end. So it will definitely, there are people who are opposed to referendum again, but it will uh, definitely boil down to that. Yeah, comrade, you've made a very good point. Um, I will put you on the spot. You say that in the diaspora, uh, what I understood from you is, uh, which is true, is that before a referendum is conducted, there are meetings in the background. It will also take ingenuity to educate and sensitize our people to build the confidence and the trust in the people who will be meeting in the background for this to go on. We understand that, but well, you are the face and the voice of the struggle right now. I want you to look at the camera and give your own suggestion as to who should represent our people because one of, we are our greatest problem. <laughs> we would like to unite to, to kill ourselves uh, because what I have observed all these years, since 2016, that when we get in a room, La Republic will just be laughing because they, uh, 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 it has given an opportunity for us to kill ourselves and then La Republic will, will walk away. And that has happened. Uh, and as well as I have equally attended conferences from here to Washington DC. And I mean, conferences have been held in, in Nigeria and out of the country. When you ask yourself, what are the results from these conferences? I believe that people have to build on something that has happened and moving forward. And uh, I think we have been doing it, but we are more fractured than agreeing that, and it looks to me as if this current generation, we are just opposing for personality instead of putting the struggle ahead. 
our forefathers, they gave a lot. They gave a lot and for the state. But this current generation, they are putting themselves before the state. So in your own suggestion, how do you think we can get a consensus to get representatives to meet with us? Briefly, please, because we are running out of time and there's important uh, topic that I would like you to, to discuss. Let me say this very quickly. You see, it will be preposterous for anyone to sit on a television program and say, I'm naming this man, I'm pinpointing that lady, I'm pinpointing that to go and uh, represent us. But what I want to say here is very important. Listen, after being in a system that lives, breeds, and eats divide and rule for almost 60 years, you don't expect us to overnight shake all of that off our bodies and become too united <laughs> you expect. Take note, there are people in this movement, in the heart of this movement, planted by the government of Cameroon, who will speak Ambazonia in the morning, Ambazonia in the afternoon, Ambazonia in the evening, who will dress, even right their underwear to be all Ambazonia colors, but they are in here to continue setting and creating confusion, to give the impression to the world that we are very divided, but I have bad news for them. The bad news I have for them is that the first and most important thing you should note is that Southern Cameroonians are united at least as to what we want. We all want freedom. We all want independence. That's a very important thing. Then next, these conferences have not been altogether useless. These conferences have shown most of the time that the problem is generally not us. The problem is the wedge that is placed among us. Like God will have it. We couldn't just walk into Boya immediately after two, three years. We're mm -hmm. going to, to tear ourselves apart. Good we are staying in the wilderness a bit longer like the, like the children of Thanks. Israel did because we are, go, we are going through a, select, a kind of selection process. The bad seats are showing themselves and the people are putting them behind them. Definitely those who continue to stand for the people, the people are knowing them. Yeah. The Lord Jesus Christ said, I know my sheep and my sheep know me. So by the day the people are knowing who is fighting for us and who is against us. Those who came in to play games, they have run impatient and a good lot of them are even editing themselves out. So I want to assure you that there will come a time where this <laughs> story, this history of you know, conferences and perhaps the next day quarreling and all on will become a thing of the past. Look on the ground. Let me take you on the ground. You notice that all what you have as this unity abroad and all doesn't touch the ground. Whatever is happening abroad and all doesn't touch the people on the ground. More and more on the ground, the people have understood that all the divisive tendencies that they have abroad and all are only meant to dim the struggle. So they are ignoring those things. They don't take on them again and they stand to, uh, you know, they face what they believe to be right. We are on the right path. We will be on the right path. We will operate like a united lot. We will not be anything that they often try to refer to as Southern Sudan. No, Southern Cameroons will become a beacon of democracy as soon as we get back to our territory because all the things you see abroad will not go back home. Trust me yeah. on that. That's very, very true, comrade. But it is good that we raise the light now. Sitting and assuming that things will work themselves uh, it's not a good uh, strategy. And I also believe that um, the race is not for the swift, but for those who keep on running and learning from the mistakes that uh, come along. Programs so, like this one that, that, that we are doing with you, there are many education campaigns that are also carried out there. And there are a lot of other people educating the people on a daily basis that is the work that we are doing to ensure we get those results. We're not Thank just you. sitting. And I want to this congratulate is. you too for being in the arena and doing just that. Let's congratulate ourselves. We are all <laughs> in the arena. <laughs> I take that as seriously as a compliment for all of us. Thank you. Okay. Uh,